Hello. Great. Oh, untitled recording. Okay. Well, hello everyone. It's uh, evening for me here, but um, whatever time it is for you, welcome to uh, one of the live streams for Exorcisms Analytical April. So my name is Aaron. I'm a software developer based in Boston, and I'm going to work on some exercises in the, um, in the Julia language this evening. So let me just get things set up, um, and then we'll get going. So I've never used this particular platform before, but it seems pretty straightforward. So I am going to make sure that I can share my screen and all that. Uh, couldn't really test until you know we're live so oh, okay so now permissions just a second there we go let me just okay and here let me also open um this window here cool So thanks for bearing with me, everyone, as I sort out my screen share here, because of course, um, without the screen, there isn't much to see. Okay, so I'm not sure if that worked or not. Oops. I don't want this to be open. Leave page here. Okay. So let me make sure that I can share here. Okay, that's not working in just a second. Okay, so having a little bit of a problem here. So let me just try opening the window first and go for that. I don't know if I need to resize or any of that kind of thing. That's no big deal. Okay, so I will just share my single VS Code window. Maybe that will work. Just a second. Okay, just a, just a second here. I need to, of course, I need to restart my browser. Great. Uh, just a moment, please. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me, everyone. Okay, now let me see if I can actually share my dang screen. Browser lack screen, oh my god. Well, this stinks. Because I don't even know what to do. I did what it told me to do and it didn't work. 
Your mom is here. That's so embarrassing. Okay, finally. All right, I'm just going to share a single window. It's working. I'm not going to record yet, but it's working. Okay. Okay, cool. So, um, sorry about the difficulties there. That's, of course, my bad for um, not making sure that everything worked right before I tried to do this because I made sure like four days ago. And as it always goes, uh, I forgot some of the particulars in between. So, um, what I'm going to do tonight is tackle at least one exercise. I might, you know, depending on time, either get through just the one or more than one or not even the one. I'm not really. Um, attached to, to, to that. I'm more just going to try to um, motivate some of the choices of the Julia language um, without getting too, uh, without too much overload at the beginning, right? Because I find sometimes that information about Julia tends to emphasize what makes Julia Julia in a way that, you know, it's, it seems cool, but like, what is that useful for? <laughs> uh, which, of course, once you get used to the tool, becomes more and more obvious. But at the start, especially in the spirit of this analytical April, where it might be the first time you've tried Julia, the first time you've tried a tool like this, um, I thought it might be neat to try and pay a little bit of attention to, you know, what what is special about Julia, in, in, especially compared to a language like Python um, or, or R, which is the other language that um, is part of this of this this theme this month. So I have my VS Code window here open. This is more or less kind of the standard development environment for uh, the Julia community. Um, there's a really nice extension for VS Code. Uh, there's really nice integration with with the Julia tool in general. Um, and so that's what I'm going to use today. Uh, of course, you can use other tools like Vim or Emacs or whatever you like. Um, I was a Vim, a Vim user for quite some time, um, but I've just uh, switched over in the last couple of years and I'm really enjoying this tool. So that's what I'm gonna be using tonight, but um, I will try not to, to use too many particularities in that regard. So um, the first thing I'm gonna do is I am going to um, download the exercise that I'm gonna be looking at tonight. So right now I have nothing in here. Um, and I have my exorcism CLI tool set up. So uh, this is usually the, the way I like to do exercises on exorcism, uh, just because I'm used to the CLI interface uh, for other tools and stuff like that. Uh, I've used the web interface a couple of times, but I'm not all that used to it. And so I'm just gonna stick with what I'm comfortable with for tonight. Um, so what I'm gonna do real quick is retrieve the, um, the URL for this. So just one second here. just to make sure that I um, have this set up right. So, okay. So now I'm not gonna go into how to set up the, um, the CLI tool. It actually is almost as easy as, as looking it up. As long as you have an exorcism account, it will more or less walk you through the entire process. Um, so once you have that set up, you just either, you know, um, work through the exercises through here um, or go back and forth kind of whatever you like there so what i'm doing right now is i'm just kind of getting the um the command that i need here to download this right and of course it's even simpler <laughs> than i remembered uh we just tell it which exercise we want to download and which track we want to use and they all follow a pretty particular structure language by language so in the case of um Julia and Exorcism, there's usually a file where we do kind of our code writing, and then there's this run tests.jl, which is where we will um, have a whole bunch of tests that have to pass basically in order to, uh, to make this exercise. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go ahead and open up um, this folder. And the reason I'm going to do that is just so um, you know I can see the folder, the files in the tree, so that way Julia could be aware of the environment I want to use and that kind of thing. So as you'll see, right, right now we really just have kind of the basic bare bones structure. Sorry about that. Uh, of just here is the test file, which I'll make even a little bit bigger yet. 
Um, here is this complex numbers.jl, which actually has some work from before that I'm just going to go ahead and delete. Okay. And um, so we're going to start totally from scratch here, right? So I have worked on this exercise before, but I'm not going to use any kind of any of my past code or anything like that. We're just going to do it more or less live. It does retrieve automatically your kind of past attempts, hence why well, you kind of saw that stuff there. So if the eagle eyed of you might have gotten <laughs> to see some of the game, but I have not looked at this um, within the last couple of days, at least I did kind of take a quick look at the exercise just to make sure there weren't any uh, crazy gotchas that I didn't remember or anything like that. But um, as with most of these exorcism exercises, there's, there's really not much, in, not much like that. So the way I'm going to do this, the way that it's kind of typical to do is to go through kind of test by test here and more or less try and approach these tests one at a time, uh, writing you know just enough code to get each test to pass. Okay, and, and I'm kind of throughout the time I'm going to try and think about you know what each test is representing you know uh, as far as that goes. But in most cases, um, that's a great way to approach these exorcism exercises, just because um, it helps you break down the problem a little bit. So. Before we get into any of what this stuff means, right? I'm not going to explain any of this terminology quite yet. What I am going to do is go over what is the exercise we're going to do, right? Because I've gone ahead and downloaded everything and gotten set up, but I haven't really talked about what we're going to do yet. So this exercise deals with complex numbers. So complex numbers um, you may have dealt with in uh, your mathematics or physics or uh, other education. Or... These are uh, kind of extension of the real numbers. Uh, and we're really not going to think about too much of the mathematical context as far as this exercise goes. What I like about this exercise is that it's a way to think about um, a new data type that's very, relatively simple in its construction and its behavior, but does need some kind of very particular setup in order to make sense in terms of what we think of when we think of that data type. So I'm not going to go through all of the detail here in this readme right now. Um, we're going to kind of go through this bit by bit, right? Because I am going to try and more or less simulate, you know, how we would actually approach this exercise uh, if we had kind of no idea what we were doing here, no idea what we had done before, any, any of that kind of stuff, other than, you know, having have, had some programming experience. So for those of you that have experience with Julia, especially in the, fir the first uh, couple minutes here, you might um, notice some details that I, that I gloss over or maybe some things that aren't quite best practices, that kind of thing. Um, and that's mostly just because I'm going to leave it uh, a little bit of time to motivate why we want to do things that way, as opposed to just saying, you know, this is the Julia way. Uh, of course, I'm not going to leave that for too long because um, I've been in that position where I kind of know what's going to happen ahead of time and it's just, it's maddening, right? Um, but especially when we're first putting this complex number type together, I am going to more or less kind of do it as if Julia was a Python replacement. Right, as, uh, as far as, as much as we can do that um, at the start, and then deal with the particularities of like type parameters and that kind of stuff um, once we get at least a couple of tests in. Right? Because again, if I were doing this from scratch um, and I was dealing with a new kind of data type, that's probably how we would approach it, right? We might have some idea of how we want, what kind of parameters we want to use and that kind of stuff, um, but a lot of times it's better to, to start to put things together and get a sense of what we're going to need. So I, we are really are really are starting from scratch here, right? In that um, I have disabled all but this first test, right? Um, and it, what this first line here is doing is just including, right? Bringing in all of the um, code that's in this complex numbers.jl as if we wrote it in here. So this include statement in Julia works basically like the the hash include in C and C right? Where it's as if we wrote the contents of this file right here. And for now, at least, we're not going to deal with modules or anything like that. We're just going to kind of write our code in this complex numbers.jl, run our test file, and work it like that. So um, VS Code has this uh, built-in uh, Julia REPL, built-in Julia interface, which I'm going to open now. Okay, And um, make it just a little bit smaller so we can see some of our stuff here. And right now, if I hit my um, right bracket, right, when I open this REPL, this brings me to the, the package manager. And you'll see on the left here, it says version 1.9, right? I'm working in my kind of global global package namespace here, which is fine for some stuff, right? There are some packages that are nice to keep available everywhere. But for the purposes of kind of illustrating how this stuff works, I'm going to go ahead and activate um, a project here, right? Activate an environment here. <clears throat> 
plan. This really doesn't make much of a difference right now, just because we're not really going to use any outside packages or anything like that. But it's usually a good idea, just so that way you don't, you know, accidentally add stuff to your global namespace here or anything like that. Um, and again, one of the, I think, the strengths of Julia is that this is, this is more or less built into the language, right? How this stuff works, right? We, we don't have to call into any um, outside packages, outside utilities, or anything like that. This is all just available from from the Julia REPL, which is pretty neat, in my opinion. And the other nice thing about this is once we start to write code in here, we can execute this code, you know, line by line, uh, selection by selection in this Julia REPL attached to the uh, attached to VS Code, which is going to be really useful. So the first thing we have here, right, is this first test, right? If I just go ahead and include this run test.jl and I look at my output, right, first things first, complex number not defined. <laughs> So if I'm going to approach this in the most naive way, the first thing I'm going to have to do is make a type called complex number. So in Julia, the way that we define types is with um, the keyword struct. Right, so we're going to have struct complex number. And in Julia, we do often end most statements, most blocks with the end keyword, which takes a little bit of getting used to, but um, in my opinion, makes code a little bit more readable, especially when compared to Python, just because it's easier to tell when, when blocks are ending beyond just indentation. But that's just um, often just a style thing. Okay, so yeah, uh, one thing that has just occurred to me is that I have not been paying any attention to the, uh, to the, the chat here, as far as I can tell. Um, I can't even I can't even see it right now. Sure, yeah. So what I'll do is I will have kind of field some questions uh, as we go, um, and hopefully my next live stream will be a little bit more technically inclined. Luckily, I do have my partner here helping me, um, and she will write down some questions as we go through, or you know, kind of pass them to me, and we'll uh, we'll address those. So first off, I mean, this is a totally valid type definition as far as Julia goes, right? Um, we can make, you know, these very simple types that don't carry any data whatsoever that are, you know, more or less just names for things. Um, and that can be useful in terms of uh, assigning traits, assigning um, properties to types as far as Julia's um, notion of type inheritance goes, which is a little bit different than what you might be used to if you're used to a language like Python. Uh, or any object-oriented programming language in general, just because um, Julia is not object-oriented, strictly speaking. So right now, if I try and in import this code here, I get a better message than I got before, right? And that message is that my test failed, right? Before, it wouldn't even run. I got an error during the test, right? Now my test is run, but it's failed. So this is a good sign as far as test-driven development goes, right? And so my, the first question that I'll address right now before we go any further, because if you are trying to follow along, this is going to be a pretty big deal, uh, as far as the, rec the recommended way of installing Julia. Uh, luckily, this has gotten a lot easier in recent months it's got, uh, compared to uh, the, last few, uh, the initial uh, years of Julia when you sometimes would have to compile it yourself and stuff like that. Now there's this tool called, um, I'll write it in my REPL here, called Julia Up. So if you just do a search for Julia Up, um, it is based on and implemented similarly to the tool called Rust Up. And this is how you should install Julia, uh, more or less on whatever platform you're on. So I think the question that I got was from Pop OS. Um, I am currently running on Fedora right now. Um, you might see some Mac OS stylings, right? That's because I'm running this on my laptop, but I am SSH into a Fedora instance, right? And I did use Julia up uh, to install this in the first place. And it's actually very easy. It helps you manage different versions of Julia. Uh, that's the way to do it these days. I would not install Julia through your distributions package manager. Um, it's, there's nothing strictly wrong with it, but it tends to be... Um, it tends to be easier to use Julia up just because it manages, like, adding adding Julia to your path, um, if you do want to have different versions present, if you do want to make sure that you're updating, you know, it's it's a little bit easier to do that way. So that's the way that I recommend this tool called Julia Up, uh, especially especially on Linux. Okay, I'm just gonna take a little drink here. Okay, so getting back to the task, right? We do notice that our test has failed because we have this expression complex number, right, the symbol that I'll explain in a second, number, 
Okay, so this symbol is a is a an idea that you almost certainly know, but as far as I know, is a symbol that is unique to Julia, <laughs> and this means is a subtype of, right? So this means that what this test, if we look at run test.jl, right, what this test is actually testing is that complex number, the type that we've made, is a subtype of the existing Julia type called number. Okay, number, as you'll see here in my tool tip, right? Number is this abstract type for all number types, right? And one of the reasons why this is useful is that just by defining complex number as a subtype of number, we will inherit some functionality that's defined elsewhere in, in within Julia for the number the number type, right? Because while Julia isn't object oriented, um, there is a sense of what's called multiple dispatch, which is kind of like an operator overloading where uh, the Julia compiler will always look for a function that, you know, fits the types that you pass it the best. So there are plenty of functions that will work just on kind of a general number type as long as other operations are defined kind of like addition and subtraction. Um, and as long as we do that, right, the Julia compiler will know stuff about that, right? But that isn't the same thing as object inheritance, right, in something like Python, just because these methods are not, strictly speaking, attached to the type, right? Because I can totally define complex number just as I did right here. And then if I want to satisfy this type, all I have to do is add, you know, is a subtype of number. And of course, it's going to get mad that I've redefined my constant. So I, 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 I restart my REPL. I include this run test.jl again. And now my test pass, right? This, or my test passes, <laughs> right? This first test. So far, this doesn't mean much, right? But this is going to be something that's important. Right, because if we look through the Julia documentation, there are certain functions that are part of base Julia that if we define for this subtype of number, we will kind of get other implementations, other functions, other methods for free kind of as part of that. And I'm not really gonna get too much into those kind of details, uh, at least not right yet, depending on how much time we have and all that. Um, but for now, right, all we have to do is set it up like this. Yes, so here is a great question. Um, Julia has support for complex numbers already built in. Totally true, right? One thing that if you do look at the readme for this, this question, um, that is a pretty, important, a pretty important assumption to make is to assume that there is no implementation. So actually, depending on how much time we have, we might do a little bit of comparison with how the existing complex number type behaves. And, um, and if I do right now, if I do, you know, z equals complex one, two, not complex number, I do have this existing type that I could do all kinds of mathematical operations on as part of base Julia, right? I don't need to implement in, uh, import any packages. I don't need to do anything special. This will just work right now. So we're implementing kind of as an exercise uh, a type that is like that. And the neat thing about Julia is that we will more or less be able to do everything that the existing complex type does as long as we define the right set of methods uh, because most of Julia is implemented in Julia. That's a very different, a very big difference from a language like Python where say, you know, like NumPy is all C and C++ code, at least the uh, performance critical parts. Um, you can write performance, performant Julia without having to call into any other code, which is one of the neat aspects. And, you know, depending on how much of this exercise we get through, we will have more or less a drop in replacement for this existing complex number type. But you're totally right that this is something, this is just for an exercise, right? If you want to do complex arithmetic uh, in Julia, you could do that right now without having to do any of the stuff that we're about to do, which is one of the reasons why we have to use the name complex number in the first place. So now if I look ahead at my tests, there's one kind of alteration I'm gonna make here. This next test is testing that uh, complex number zero one squared is equal to complex number negative one zero, right? We're not even gonna really talk about what that means yet. Um, but what that does mean is this is testing multiplication, right? Um, I would rather test this after we get the arithmetic operations going. And this is something we do sometimes in development, right? As we look at our test suite, which some of, some of which we might write ahead of time, some of which we don't and say, okay, well, some of these tests uh, kind of depend on others in ways that we don't initially anticipate, right? And also it's gonna be easier for the purposes of illustration to do stuff like implement the, the addition and subtraction operations first and then move on to, to exponentiation and that kind of stuff. So, the first thing we're going to do is think about, okay, well, we have this set of arithmetic, 
arithmetic operations that we want to satisfy. And we're just going to go one at a time. We're going to start with addition. So if we look at our readme, which specifies all that we're going to need here, uh, the sum of complex numbers is actually pretty simple, right? So a complex number is called a complex number because it's a, a complex of numbers, right? It, it is made up of two separate parts, two separate numbers, what we call the real part and the imaginary part. As far as addition and subtraction go, when we add complex numbers, we add the real parts and the imaginary parts separately. And the sum of the real parts is the real part of our new complex number. The sum of the imaginary parts is the imaginary part of our new complex number. So at least as far as uh, addition and subtraction goes, this works just like we would want it to. And that already kind of clues me in just in the description I've just made of kind of what we're going to need here, right? We need two numbers that go along with this type we've just made. Right? By definition, right, a complex number has these two numerical parts. So as far as we understand it, and we look at our tests and everything, right? Uh, if I'm really stuck, I just start to look at kind of how these operations are done in the tests. And I say, okay, well, yeah, here, here is a constructor, right? For this complex number type that I haven't written yet, but this test requires that needs two parts. So this makes sense. So what we can do now is say, okay, well, we've got this struct definition, this type definition in Julia. It has no data associated with it. So Julia types, Julia uh, custom types, right, which we define like this, they can have data associated with them. They don't typically have functions associated with them. So they're much closer to a struct in C, hence the name, than they are to, say, a class in Python. They're a lot like a data class in Python. And what we usually do is define a type with some data and then define methods, define functions that operate on that type. And the reason why that's that's chosen over the object-oriented approach, at least as far as Julia goes, is then you it's easier to reuse types from other code in your code, from other people's code in your code, that kind of thing, because you don't have to worry about inheriting. You don't have to worry about any of that kind of stuff. So for our purposes, right, if we want to be clear about how we're naming things here, the names I'm going to start with are just, we're going to have two fields here, right? Two, two pieces of data in our data structure. We're going to have the real part, and we're going to have the imaginary part. And I'm going to leave it like this for now. Okay. So if we, you know, again, if you're experienced with Julia, you might be thinking, you know, there's slightly more we could do here to make this performant. I'm not going to worry about that just this second. Right? We're just going to say, like I said, do this kind of as if we're do, trying to make a, a Python replacement. So now there's one thing to mention here. Even though I've defined this type, and what I'm going to do is already I'm going to go ahead and restart my REPL. Um, one of the upsides of using modules is that we don't have to restart the REPL quite as much, but I don't want to deal with that, at least for this first exercise. So even though I've just added these two pieces of data to this structure, I do actually get one thing for free <laughs> as far as this goes, right? If I include this... Um, complex numbers file, right? So I have in here the code in this file, right? Because I want to be able to, oops, I want to be able to use this type I've just made in my in my REPL here, right? Strictly speaking, I could right now do something like this, where I say this is complex number one comma two. So Julia will always give us uh, by default, which may not be a, a great term to use considering we're talking about constructors, right? But so automatically it might be better. We're automatically provided with this constructor that goes field by field. And if I look here, right, z.re is one, z.m is two, just like I assigned. Okay. Now there is one thing that we will have to think about here and that is the fact that um, Julia is uh, just in time compiled language, but it is a compiled language, right? So while we can start to do things just like we're doing right now, we're thinking about this, like I said, as a Python replacement, right? A drop in replacement for any other dynamic language. This will work just fine. But especially if we're starting to be concerned about how this will perform, one thing I will point out right now is that the Julia compiler will not know what types these two pieces of data are. Right, because what I've written right here is the same as writing real bracket uh, colon colon any 
imaginary colon colon any. And what this means is that there will have to be some indirection here whenever the compiler sees one of my complex number types because it's not going to know what type this is. And so when it goes to access this data, it's not going to be able to generate instructions for the specific type that it has at hand, at least not um, ahead of time, right? It's going to have to do that at runtime. It's going to have to do that dynamically. So one thing that we can do right away to examine this is to use what's called the um, at code warn type macro. And if I do this right away, complex number one comma two, right? So far, so good, right? So I wouldn't necessarily have spotted this just now because at least right now, if I'm looking at this, right, in this dynamic context, it has dis discovered that this is that these are both integers, right? But we'll revisit this idea once we start to look at more complicated operations, right? Or even just addition. For now, we're going to leave this aside, right? I'm going to have pointed it out, but I'm not going to address this quite yet. Because as far as we're concerned, right, we're not really concerned about performance, uh, at least not at this stage, right? We're still implementing our behaviors. So our first behavior that we want to implement is this addition. And so if I think about how this is going to go, right, what I want to do is define a new function. And this plus operation that I want to define here, this is something that already exists in Julia. Right. And I can write it in this way that, you know, it's popular in um, really formal computer science, or I can write it in the way that we, I want it to write here. And one of the nice things is that, you know, Julia will treat those interchangeably as long as the operation is defined the right way. So I have to define it like this. So Julia sees this as a symbol, right? We have the special type for these kinds of things. So in order to signal that I want to actually use the symbol, the plus, I have to add this leading colon. And then to make sure that it doesn't overlap or it actually does overlap with the base Julia plus, right? So I can use it in all the same contexts that I use the plus, right? Because that's what I want to do as part of a, a number type. I want to preface this with base dot. So this is, this is an idiom in Julia. This is very, very, very common to take your own custom type and add new methods for existing functions in base, the base Julia module, right? So what I'm going to do is say, okay, well, there's this existing function called plus. It doesn't yet have a method for my complex number type, and I'm going to, I'm going to give it one. I'm going to say, well, for two complex numbers, how do I want this to look, right? Well, my real part should be x.real plus y.real, my imaginary part should be x dot imaginary plus y dot imaginary. And what I want to return is a complex number real imaginary. OK, and so let's see what we got so far. All right, so I have everything saved here, just making sure. And if I go ahead and include this run test.jl, so far, so good. Right, and one thing I'll do is I'll do that same. I'll run the same the same macro that I've just run. This code warn type, right? This will warn me whenever the Julia compiler is having trouble making inferences about types, right? For, so for just the constructor, it wasn't such a big deal. But let's see what happens for something more complicated. And here we go, right? This red stuff is put in here on purpose, right? Because already with a simple operation like addition. The Julia compiler is running into trouble with saying, okay, well, if I follow the code here, this i and r were these local variables I made, it doesn't necessarily know what type these are going to be. And why is that? Well, when I just construct the number, it knows, hey, these are two integers, hey, this is an integer and a float, hey, whatever, whatever this is. But as soon as I start passing around two complex numbers, at least it's the way I define them, there's no information about what type these hold. And so if I were to go and look at the assembly code that this generates, which you know we could do, but we're not going to do right now, we'd see all kinds of indirections, right? As opposed to the existing complex number type here, we'd see all kinds of references to the actual specific types that we're using. And that's one of the big differences. So one thing we can do right away to fix this is to add a type parameter here. So that way, we, could, we can pass this information around to, our, to Julia's compiler and say, hey, this is a complex number. 
the real and imaginary parts are of this particular type. And Julia uses a, a syntax that's pretty similar to C++ for this, um, where we just add in this parameter, right? The capital T is often used. And for a complex number, it makes sense for these two to be of the same type. Um, the reason for that is if they're of different types, we end up converting back and forth between types a lot anyways. So it makes sense for them to be of the same type. And if we look at Julia's existing complex number, right? If I, it is parameterized by a single, a single type as well. And they do the helpful thing of making sure that this type is itself a real number. And actually, we're just going to do a number, right? Because we have really no notion of complex number in this exercise. OK, so again, since I'm working outside a module, I'm just going to be safe and restart my REPL. If I go ahead and run my tests, right, things are still looking good. And now if I try this same at code warrant type to say, hey, you know, how, how are things looking now? I get no more of this red stuff. It knows that these are integers. So this is good. This means that if I, when I am starting to use this complex number type in more uh, performance critical code, right, which is possible because it's a number, right, uh, the Julia compiler will be able to reason about, you know, what instructions to use and that kind of thing. And this is, you know, as a matter of fact, also mostly gives me my, my subtraction for free. I will just go through here, change this to subtraction, and I should be good with that. If I run my tests, all my tests are passing, all six of these tests that I've done so far, right? And, and this first one. <laughs> okay, so far so good. So now multiplication can, is the one where we have to be a little bit careful. Okay. But it's still not so bad. The way that we get the formula for multiplying two complex numbers is we treat the, the we treat, basically treat everything like a regular number and do distribution. Right, so we can see right here, I'll even make this a little bit bigger for this at least, right? We can see right here, we do A plus I times B, C plus I times D. We multiply these together to get the real part and the imaginary part. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into the details of how this is done, right? Like I said, you just treat these like regular numbers and do distribution and collector like terms. So we've got AC minus BD, BC plus AD. And I'm even just going to use these labels just to make things easy on myself. So when I go ahead and do function base, um, and now I want to do multiplication, same deal here. And I will go ahead and say x, oh, sorry, a is x dot real, b is what x dot imaginary. And as I look at this, I stop and say, OK, well, here's an operation that I'm going to be doing a lot if I'm working with complex numbers, is getting the real and the imaginary part, right? And assigning those to two variables. So what I'll do is I'll add some helper functions here. Right, I'll add this function real for a complex number that just returns the real part. I'll add this function imaginary for a complex number that just returns the imaginary part. And I do like to use the explicit return. Technically, in Julia, it always returns the last line of a function, but I like to be careful about it. And I'm actually going to do something that's also pretty common in Julia, something like this, where I have a real, I'll call it real, a real image that will give me a tuple of these two. why am I doing this? Well, stuff like this, this real and imagine function, right? Um, these are, this is pretty common in Julia to uh, try and treat the actual data in a type as private, right? Of course, there is no public private spec like there is in C++ or anything like that. Um, but right here, what I've done where I'm accessing, you know, I'm defining a function in base that's accessing the internals here. This isn't like strictly wrong. And there are plenty of times where this is just fine or even the good thing to do. Um, but it is usually better to start thinking about um, providing methods to access this kind of stuff. So these are kind of like getters for a class. 
Um, and again, they're not strictly necessary, but it is good, especially once you start to get more complicated types. Um, and you don't want people to have to remember necessarily what all of the fields are and how to manipulate them and that kind of stuff. So, and the reason why I've done this is that now I can write this, you know, A comma B is equal to real imag X, right? My first complex number C comma D is equal to real imag Y. And as far as the formula I need, right, I want A times C minus B times D. And for my imaginary part, I want B times C plus A times D. And like I said, this is this is a formula you can derive for yourself. I'm not going to get into the details here, especially as we go through some of these other operations. Um, but all I need to do now, right? Complex number, real imaginary. And I've just used R and I because I want to make these new real and imaginary parts. And I could, of course, just write these right here. But again, I like to be like to be careful <laughs> uh, so I know what I've been doing in the past and that kind of thing. OK, so we have multiplication defined. We've got this multiplication set up. Let's go ahead and see if this works. OK, so base dot real must be explicitly imported to be extended. So this is a little bit a quirk of the fact that we are working with um, a type that already exists, right? So this function that I've called real kind of already exists in base. So the compiler will get mad at me if I don't um, preface it like this, which is no big deal. Cool, so all my tests are working so far, right? So, so far I've got addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Cool, so as far as what to move on to next, right? I've got one arithmetic operation left, that's division. And so if we even start to look here, we may start to suspect that uh, we might we might have to run into some some details to resolve just because before we would have been working with just integers, right? We've been getting just integers in our output. Um, now, of course, by doing division, we are dealing with floats, uh, floating point numbers. So one thing to mention right off the bat is that when it comes to um, dividing two integers, Julia does um, will return a floating point number, right? It's not like C which will return, um, in this case, would return zero as an integer, right? Does that truncation. You can emulate that behavior, but by default, it does kind of what you would want from the mathematical perspective. So um, as far as how we're going to define this next operation, well, there is, uh, we could look at the way that this is done in um, right here. Right, which would probably be the easiest thing to do. So actually what I'll do so here is something slightly smarter and I'll copy and paste this into my window here so I can refer to it. I'll just put this down here as a comment. Okay, cool. So this is the formula I want to implement right, for my division. So let's go ahead and just try and, one, when, uh, working with Julian in particular, one of the first things to do is just to try and, you know, more or less transcribe the formula that you're working with. And a lot of times that is kind of good enough. So I want to define right the symbol of division. And so one question you might have right before I go any further is um, my type definition, I use this type parameter. Right. Uh, but I haven't used it, and I actually don't need to use it even you know outside of the 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 building things from scratch aspect, right? I don't need to use it in any of these definitions, right? Because if I pass uh, a type of complex uh, variable of co type complex number to say you know the this real function from base, right? It will say, okay, well, what is the strictest type definition I can apply that I have a method for, right? And of course, in our case, it's going to be this complex number. And it will use that method and generate those type specific instructions based on this this parameter. I could I could write this. I could add the type parameter, and I have to add this where t where I would add restrictions to it. I could do that, right? Um, but I don't, strictly speaking, need to at this point because I don't need to use this parameter for anything, right? So this is not like C plus plus in this regard, where in a C plus plus template. I would need to include this type parameter even if I didn't necessarily use it. But in Julia, without affecting performance, this kind of definition is just fine, unless I need the type parameter for something, which right now we don't. 
So as far as how I'm going to implement this, right, I will just kind of uh, crib for myself as far as this initial approach goes. I am just going to try and transcribe this formula more or less. Right? The one thing I will observe is that we do use this factor in the denominator, this c squared plus d squared appears in both cases. So what I'll do is um, I will do, you know, denom equals c squared plus d squared. Notation-wise, this is how we do exponentiation in Julia. We don't have to do any of that star star stuff that we do in Python. So for our real part, right, we'll have uh, b times c minus a times d. Oops, sorry. Of course, even if I've copied and pasted into the window, I still write down our a times c plus b times d over my denominator. For my imaginary part, I have b times c minus a times d over my denominator. And strictly speaking, right, we haven't paid any attention to what this symbol i actually means, which is not that big a deal, right? If you actually, a lot of times when you're dealing with complex numbers, um, the, you know, square root negative one part of it is the least important part. And the, the fact that these are two numbers together that can be treated in a lot of cases like a regular number, as long as you're careful, is the more important part, right? Which is why I've chosen to kind of not really talk too much about that, at least not yet. So now I'm just about there, right? I just return my complex number. And let's see how this goes. Okay, so here's some trouble, right? My division tests have failed. Why have they failed? They actually haven't even failed, right? We've got an error during the test. So now is where we start to go one by one, right? So what I will do is just look at one of these tests at a time. Okay. And I will go ahead and include this. Even that one's failing, which is, you know, it's not such a big deal. <laughs> no method matching complex number float 64 in 64, right? So this is the compiler saying, okay, well, you tried to give me a method that doesn't exist. And why is that? Well, right here or somewhere in this operation, right? I'm trying to pass to this complex number constructor 0 0.5 and 0. And a 0 literal, right, if I just write it like this, that's a 64-bit integer. Right, so that's a big difference for MATLAB is that Julia does actually represent types in kind of a what I'll call a sane way, and in that int there is there are integer types, right? Integer literals are integers. You know, not everything is an array, none of that stuff, right? It does have a type structure that mirrors something like C plus plus. If I write the 0, 0.0 or if I you know write float zero or something like that, I do get a float, right? But if I just write zero, I get an int. So this is trying to call a constructor that doesn't exist because all I've been provided by automatically with Julia is this constructor that takes two parameters with the same type, which is no big deal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new constructor. So this is one nice concession that Julia makes um, is we can write constructors or uh, concession to a more object oriented style, at least in naming, is that we can write a constructor that looks like this. And I can use a type name for uh, a function. It will just automatically treat this as a, as a constructor. So what do I want to do here? Well, I want to have two complex numbers, or sorry, two regular numbers of different types, right? So I don't want to write this, because this would basically just shadow my existing method. What I do want to write is have these two type parameters be two different types. And why am I including this? Well, if I were to just write complex number x comma y without any of this stuff, um, this is a, the, 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 the compiler is not going to know what to do here, right? Because it's not going to know whether to delegate to this one, right? It's not going to know because this is too general. A lot of times in Julia, we don't need to do type annotations like this, right? But in this case, we do. Because in this case, we very much specifically want to ensure that these are separate types. And we are going to want to operate on these types. So I'm going to go ahead and grab these type parameters. That's how we do this, right? This where statement. So this is a little bit funky if you're not used to it. What this is doing is I can then list my type parameters, kind of like um, we do a template in C++, right? Template bracket T. And I can even do restrictions on these. And I'll do go ahead and make these both numbers. That's not really going to make much of a difference right now because all of our tests are numbers anyways. But you know, if you do know what strict restrictions you can make, you might as well use some. And the first question I'm going to have is, okay, now what am I going to do here? <laughs> right? I'm going to have complex x comma y. 
what what have I changed? And here is where we have a big difference from a language like Julia versus a language like Python is that now we can actually operate on these types. These type these are more than just type annotations, right? This is actually saying this is the method for x of type tx, y of type ty. We will only look at this method if these are of two different types, right? Because Julia's compiler, if these are of the same type, will always go for this built-in constructor because that's the most specific one. So what I can do here is use what's called type promotion, right? Which is a concept from, you know, more than just Julia. But what I can do is say, okay, well, I'm going to grab a type that is the promotion of this X type and Y type. And what a, a type promotion is, if you're not familiar, right? This is a common type that both of these can be converted to. At least that's the kind of quick and dirty way to describe it. And I'll go ahead and do that. Right, it can be, I will go ahead and use the convert function, right? I could also use the constructor for this T type if I wanted to. And now what I've done is define a constructor that will figure out how to deal with the fact that these are two different types. And this can be dealt with, right, by the compiler, right? When it sees two different types at compile time or at runtime, right? For every different combination of types, it will generate um, new, com new, new machine code for those two types that it will reuse from that point on every time it sees those two. That's why we talk, call it just in time. So if I start to look at this, okay, so we have this um, complex number and complex F64 fail to change any arguments. That's because I've done, I've flubbed here and written complex instead of complex number. I was wondering how long it would take me to do that. What I've accidentally done is use the built-in complex type. So if I go ahead and run these, now my tests pass, right? Great feeling. Okay, so the first one passes. What about the second one? Let's not get too excited, right? Second one passes. Third one, okay, let's see. We have this funky symbol in the middle, right? What's this? So I did get a question, is this like C++ concepts? Um, without being too familiar with that, uh, basically uh, there is a notion in Julia of an abstract type, right? A type that you cannot instantiate. It is not as direct as it is in C++, right? So I'm gonna talk in the sense of um, what I'm a little bit more familiar with, which is just the kind of regular polymorphism stuff, um, which I, uh, you'll have to forgive me because constant, I haven't gotten up to the, the C++ 20 and 23 standards yet. Um, so the way that it works basically is you can designate a type in Julia as abstract. So it is a little bit easier to start off with, right? So I could have abstract, I'm going to call it, I wouldn't really need to do this, right? But I could have a type called abstract complex number, right? And this would be a type that I could not instantiate, right? I couldn't make, you know, I'm not going to go ahead and define that, but I couldn't do x equals abstract complex number. I couldn't construct that, but I could define methods based on that, right? And the classic case is um, abstract matrix, right? There are all kinds of methods, and in a lot of cases, if you're writing new code for a matrix, you should use a function. Your function should be like f of m bracket uh, colon colon abstract matrix, because then your function will work on anything that you know is a subtype of a matrix. And the compiler will figure out the rest as far as, you know, what the type parameters are, you know, that kind of stuff. So it isn't quite the same as regular polymorphism or anything like that, but I think it is relatively similar to that kind of idea. Again, without being too much on the, well, I do like the modern C++, I unfortunately am not super familiar with anything past C++ 17. So getting back to our exercise here, um, the big problem that we have right, is this operation here. Okay, because what, what the compiler is trying to do is it's trying to convert things in a way that we, we haven't defined, right? This is kind of a bad sign. And what this is, is Julia lets you use uh, Unicode for a lot of stuff, right? So I can write backslash um, a prox, and that will give me this, right? I can write backslash pi, and that will give me, you know, the value for pi. So this is pretty common to see. This is, this is the same as the is a prox function from base. And I tend to like to use the actual functions just because um, 
it's hard to like copy and paste Unicode symbols and things like that. Uh, but this is also pretty common. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is figure out what that means, right? Because as far as equality goes, Ju Julia's compiler is smart enough, as we've already seen, right, to figure out what it means for two complex numbers to be equal. It will just compare their fields. It is not smart enough to know necessarily um, what approximately equal means. Right, so what is that going to mean in our case for complex numbers? I don't need to do this business with the symbol because this is just a regular old function. It is, you know, alias to that Unicode symbol, but I'm not going to mess with that for um, definition purposes. So I'll have x complex number, y complex number. And then what I'm going to do is the same thing as before, a, b equals real match x. C, D equals real match Y, right? Just getting these two pieces because what I want to be able to do is compare these, you know, is a prox, each of these, right? Is a prox A and C, right? Real parts and imaginary parts. And there's one piece I'm going to add here um, that is something that is pretty similar to Python. And what I can do is add, you know, the facility for any number of keyword arguments. And the reason why I'm going to do this is because, you know, this base is a prox method. This function has keyword arguments that are associated with it, All right? The relative tolerance, the absolute tolerance, that kind of stuff. And I'm not really going to use those directly in my code, but what I want to be able to do is to be able to pass those to these two invocations of, um, the is a prox. So that way, what I could do is do, you know, if I had two complex numbers, I could do is a prox x comma y and add some kind of relative tolerance, and Julia would kind of know what I mean there. It would just pass this relative tolerance to both of these. So this is a pretty, this notation is different than Python, but the idea is pretty similar where this is, you know, an arbitrary number of keyword arguments that's getting collected here and then uncollected here. And that's all, it turns out it's, that's all I'm gonna need, right? For this for this division, right? Because what this has done is now, um, Julia was trying to figure out via type promotion, via conversion, via kind of what I had given it so far, what this approximately equal meant. I was not figuring it out correctly. So what we've done is say, no, no, we know what this should mean. We're gonna go ahead and help you out and this will help with our division. And actually what's neat here is that this part is done for free as well. <laughs> Julia knows now that I've called this a number and now that I've defined this multiplication operation, it knows what to do at, at least kind of in the naive sense for exponentiation. And it knows what to do that, what to do in a performant way. And so we've got a couple of more things here, right? And actually, if I look at these tests, I've kind of accidentally done <laughs> two, of, two of these blocks here with this real and imaginary. I've got two two operations left. I won't look at the bonus uh, stuff because I'm already getting short on time here. I've got the absolute value and I've got the complex conjugate. So the absolute value of a complex number, uh, the best way to think about it is um, the same as the best way to think about the regular absolute value, right? It's the magnitude of the numbers, the distance of that number from the origin, from zero. So if I go ahead and plot a complex numbers, right? I have one axis for real, one axis for imaginary. I plot my A and my B, right? I get a point and I measure its distance from the center. And I can do that with the Pythagorean theorem. And that is more or less exactly how we do this, right? If I look at my readme and I look at um, how to do the absolute value, which I think it mentions towards the top here, right? This really is just <laughs> Pythagorean theorem, right? It's, uh, uh, a squared equals a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Of course, I can't even probably say it right. So that's going to be pretty nice, right? Because if I want to do base dot abs of a complex number, well, I could do this, right? I could do a comma b equals real image x, and then return square root a squared plus b squared. This is totally fine. And for our purposes, this is, this is fine. Uh, but since we're talking about um, Julia in particular and some of the the um, details that Julia has included in order to be a kind of numerically focused language, we do have this kind of helpful function called hypot, which is pretty similar to the function that you have in the C++ standard library, right? If I have hypot a comma b, 
This will do the same thing I just wrote, but we'll also sensibly deal with underflow and overflow and that kind of stuff. So this will be helpful to use here. And I think I actually had not um, uncommented this test yet, so let's go ahead and see if we've got... Cool. And so now the complex conjugate, depending on um, how long it's been since you've looked at complex numbers, uh, might be the one that is a little bit less familiar. This is, unfor uh, fortunately, one of the easier ones mathematically. So the complex conjugate of a complex number, or just the conjugate of the complex number, is the same complex number just with the negative imaginary part, right? If you want to be very careful about your terminology, right? The, the additive inverse of the imaginary part. So if I have, maybe it's even easier to write it, right? If I have um, a complex number that's uh, x equals complex number a comma b, right? What I really want to do, um, and I'll go ahead and use base.con because I think it'll get mad at me if I don't because that does already exist. What I want to do is say, well, I have my a, b is equal to real imag x, and I just want to return a complex number with the same real part, but negative b is its imaginary part. Okay. Oops, and I've gone ahead and put that in my test, right, because I got distracted here by trying to, to write things out. Cool. Let me make sure that is actually set. Okay, so let's see what we've got here. Oops, and let me make sure that I have put this together right. Oh, of course, I've made a, a mistake here in that I have returned this tuple A comma negative B, right? Because I was trying to both illustrate the concept of the conjugate and implement the conjugate function at the same time, which is never a good idea. So all I have to do here is just write complex number. And the reason why I knew that, right, is because if I look here, it tells me what it's evaluated is it, on the left-hand side, the tuple 5 comma 0. On the right-hand side, the complex number 5 comma 0. Those are obviously not going to be the same thing, right? Because I haven't told them to compare those equivalently. So all I have to do to fix that is just to actually call the constructor at the end here. And that's pretty much all of my arithmetic operations. OK, so let's see. We've got 10 minutes left. Would probably be good is to at least take a crack at these bonus uh, exercises. Right? I don't really necessarily want to start another one. Um, so let's take a look here at our complex exponential. So this is one that we'll again have to look at the formula. So the good way to think about this is, um, you know, if you're interested in deriving it yourself, is to use Euler's formula, right? Uh, uh, cosine theta plus I sine theta for a complex number and just the regular rule for exponentiation, right? So we have E to the A plus IB is E to the A times E to the IB, right? Just the regular addition rule for exponents. And then we just break down what that means, right? So E to the A is just going to be a real number, right? Because A is real. We have to figure out what to do with the second part. And for that, we use Euler's formula, right? E to the I theta is cosine theta plus I sine theta. So let's go ahead and do that. And make sure it's base.exp. I'm right? going to just use exp, and I'll go ahead and uncomment this. Cool. OK, so I will actually do the same thing I did before, right? And I will at least just write this part. right here for my reference. So I want to treat these separately, right? So what I'll do is a comma b, right? One of the reasons why I define this is because this little this trick of splitting this out into a tuple into two variables is pretty useful. And the first part I have, right, will be right, I'll write this as r times e to the i times theta. So that first part, my r, will be xp, right, e to the power of a, 
And as far as how to deal with e to the i theta, right, that comes down to this Euler's formula, right, where I'll even just write at the bottom here, e to the power i theta is cosine theta plus i times sine of theta. So in our notation, right, for what we've been calling a complex number, this would be complex number of sine theta cosine theta. And I mean, I've been using theta here because that's the typical notation, right? Um, these actually should really all be b's because we've been using b. All right, and we've more or less done what we need here, right? In that the second part, which um, I will call e to the i theta, will be uh, the complex number of um, sine b cosine b. And then we will return r times e to the i theta. And I suspect that we will have to be careful about this operation, right? Because we're multiplying a real number by a complex number, and we haven't necessarily said how that's done yet. Oh, the tests are marked broken, right? So this is something we can do in Julia is we can, you know, conveniently mark these tests as things that we need to skip or not, which I probably should have been using this test skip instead of uh, just commenting things out, but that's not a big deal. Okay, yeah, so, um, right, it's trying to promote complex and float 64, right? It doesn't really know what to do there. Um, so what we can do, well, there's a couple of things we could do. Uh, with the last, you know, five minutes we have, right? We could um, just define what that operation means, right? That's the first thing to try. I will go ahead and call this A could be any real number. Um, B could be a complex number. And again, one thing to emphasize is that the way I've written this function, unless I actually need these type parameters, this will be this will the compiler will be able to generate many many methods for this, depending on what actual type A is and what the you know parameters of B are. Right, this is not the same as what I was doing before, right, where I had these two type fields be any and any, right, because it can't generate more than one version of what it means to be this data structure. It can generate a whole bunch of different versions of what this function means, and will generate a new one every time it sees a new combination of the type of A and the type parameter of B. Right. So what we can do here is I will just do kind of the thing we would think of first, right, where we would say this would be, um, I'll call it A complex, would be a complex number A comma zero. And I'll actually even be careful and call this zero A. And what this is a handy function that will return, you know, assuming that A is an, a number type, which we're already kind of enforcing up here, this will return the correct type of zero for this, right? And that's again something that the compiler can reason through. And actually, in most cases, if you look at the code that gets generated, right, the references to this function are gone and it just will fill in the types correctly. And we can go ahead and just return A complex times B. Let's see if this helps us. Okay, and I suspect we might have to do some stuff that will take a little bit longer than the amount of time we have left, but let's go ahead and be careful here. Or we'll say um, now A will be the complex number and B will be the real number. And that will be B times A. Invalid destruct. Oh, see, this is what ha would happen if um, I had forgotten this piece, right? I should would happen, it did happen. Right. So there was a question about destructuring before, right? So this is kind of, you know, when we do are doing stuff like um, uh, this real match function, this is a lot like destructuring, right? Um, this is basically, there are macros and stuff and helper functions to do this more programmatically in Julia, which we could use, but we haven't used here. Um, so yeah, this is basically the same thing as that. Sorry, I missed that question before, but um, in case you're still here. <laughs> Okay, so I've gone and lost track of where I was. Okay, so we're sitting right here. 
And so I've gone ahead and used the shorthand definition that you can use in Julia for functions, which I try not to use all that much, but it's nice sometimes. Uh, you can write these nice little one-liners um, that work the same. Okay. So, oops, and I've gone ahead and done the same mistake here of writing complex instead of complex number. Okay. And let's see. So looks like I have flubbed somewhere in my definition, right? Because it is looking for negative one comma zero and we have zero comma negative one. So let me make sure that I have done things right here. So we'll have e to the a, e to the b, cosine, oh, that's it, cosine b and sine b. I've gone and swapped those. There's probably several of you screaming at home <laughs> who noticed that. Okay, so we're still having trouble here with our comparison. Um, mostly having to do with floating point stuff here. So let's see as far as how this would go. We could, let me look at the test. Oops. Well, with the time we've got left, one thing we could do, right? So I will go ahead and leave this. Uh, maybe in my uh, next live stream next week, I will try and come back and revisit this. But we can do at least this last part um, where we have this, you know, the syntactic sugar, it calls it here, where um, in Julia, right, the existing complex number, we have this M that we can use, one M. Um, in order, you know, of course, we don't want to use that, right, because that exists already, so we're going to use JM instead, uh, taking the J inspiration from electrical engineering. And we could do that in a nice, clean way of saying, um, you know, if we're talking about a module, right, we can just say const JM would be equal to complex number uh, 0, 1. And this const here, right, this doesn't work quite the same way um, that it does in C and C++. Uh, it is inspired by that. But const means that this is the, the way that we ensure that this variable being a global variable uh, will be of the same type, right, signaling to the compiler that whatever type you deduce this as will stay the same and won't change. If I go ahead and run my tests, Right. So we are running into the same problem here, which of course, you know, I'll probably figure out how to resolve shortly after this live stream. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, that is all the time that I have for today. I uh, thank thanks to everyone for, for being here and for watching this with me and for working on these problems with me. Um, I will be doing this on Thursdays at 7 p.m. for the month of April. So uh, next time, hopefully I'll be a little bit more uh, technically set up and we'll be able to monitor the chat in real time and that kind of thing. So I appreciate you bearing with me and um, I hope everybody has a great night.